Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me this evening. We're going to start out with a question. And who are the two most important people in the turn of the century, Los Angeles? In my book, Ice and Oil, I introduce them to you, Dan Murphy and Godfrey Holterhoff. They actually were equal to today's billionaires of Tim Cook and Apple, or Elon Musk of Tesla. And few people have ever heard of Murphy or Holterhoff. So in the next 45 minutes, I hope to inform you of this unknown and important part of Los Angeles history. Many people ask me why or how I got interested in this subject. I wrote the book about an obscure character like Dan Murphy, and my interest began in 2002 when Our Lady of the Angels Cathedral in downtown Los Angeles opened. The donor wall mystified me as to who Dan Murphy was. When I inquired, the historians hardly knew anything. I was very intrigued. It turned out that the Dan Murphy Foundation was the primary donor for this $250 million building. In fact, the foundation founded in 1957 gives away grants of $5 million annually to various hospitals, schools, and other religious organizations. The foundation is still in existence with assets over $240 million. The interior of the cathedral is best known for its tapestries which uses computer-generated images of local people. With no assistance from the Dan Murphy Foundation, I began my research on this very enigmatic person. I traveled through four different states and went to 30 different archives and repositories, and less, of, less than 10 of these archives had any reference to do with Dan Murphy. If it weren't for the Library of Congress's digitization of local newspapers, across the country, I'd never been able to write this book. Dan Murphy, never Daniel, was born the son of an Irish famine immigrant. He was born in Hazleton, Pennsylvania in 1858. When he was only five years old, when the family left Pennsylvania after the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, they eventually migrated to Hanover, Kansas, where they staked their homestead. Uh, these are thrilling times for a teenage boy. Indians and buffalo still roam the high plains. Near the small town of Hanover, there was a reservation of Oto Indians. In the 1860s, in northeastern Kansas, was a wild and woolly place. The Chisholm Trail ended in Ellsworth, Kansas, which was just a few miles south of the Murphy homestead. The legendary Sheriff Wyatt Earp tried to tame the rowdy cowboys who celebrated their end of the trail with liquor and gunfire. A little further west is the city of Hayes, where Wild Bill Hickok and George Custer, Calamity Jane, Buffalo Bill Cody were still building their reputations. However, poverty still stalked the Murphy family of 10. So at the age of seven, Dan got a job with the St. Joseph and Western Railroad, headquartered in St. Joe, Missouri. In 1877, St. Joe, Missouri was a cosmopolitan city of 30,000 people. It was a bustling hub of hundreds of people coming and going by Mississippi River boat and one or one of the several railroads that terminated there. People came up the Mississippi, from New Orleans, St. Louis, because it was a jumping off point for the Oregon Trail. At the time, railroads were the largest industry in the nation. There was much speculation on this single industry, which resulted in a financial collapse in the Panic of 1873. Murphy saw firsthand how executives from the railroad fled the company and went, as it went into foreclosure. As young Dan listened to the businessmen aboard his train, they talked about the disappearing West and the unexplored mineral riches of the Southwest. 
he overheard them declaring the importance of getting in on the ground floor, get there before the newspapers do, and borrowing money is how smart men go broke. Dan took these mantras to heart and lived them throughout his entire life. So now I'd like to ask you to set aside your ideas regarding the development of the West and see it from Murphy's point of view. The Golden Spike was driven in 1868 when the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific Ra Railroad created the first transcontinental line. The Central Pacific was owned by the big four who called themselves the Associates, Collis Huntington, Mark Hopkins, Leland Stanford, and Charles Crocker. They had made their money through the gold rush of uh, 49 and invested their money in the Transcontinental Railroad. The route ran across the Sierras, but it was unprofitable because it was closed due to snow for five months out of the year. Huntington believed they needed an all season railroad route. So along the Southern border of California, through Texas, ending in New Orleans. From there, the passengers would be boarded on Southern Pacific ships to New York City. The big four also believed that they needed to, in order to be profitable, they could, to consolidate all of the railroads in California and keep any competing rail lines out of the state, thereby maintaining their monopoly. To forestall the Texas and Pacific Railroad from entering California, the Southern Pacific built post haste south through the Central Valley of California onto the Mojave Desert and then turned southeast towards Yuma in the Arizona Territory. There was no intention to include Los Angeles, San Bernardino, or San Diego, as they had no financial value to the railroad. They were but primitive adobes villages at the time where they raised cattle and beans. When Dan Murphy came to Los Angeles in 1876, it looked somewhat like this slide. In fact, this is a little bit newer than 1876. The first train pulled into LA from San Francisco that year and Dan, Dan came the next year by this very same route. There were only 6,000 people in this dusty village Pueblo when Dan arrived. He soon became employed with the Southern Pacific as a brakeman on the, on the Yuma line. With his previous railroad experience, Dan secured a job with the Southern Pacific as a brakeman. He was assigned to the construction train that hauled supplies to the front near Yuma, where the new tracks were being laid. If you watched Hell on Wheels on TV, you know what the front is like. Frank Monahan was the conductor of the Yuma line with Dan Murphy as his brake man. The Yuma bound train left downtown every other day at two o'clock and headed south through the desert on the night train to Yuma on the Colorado River. The U.S. Army had built a fort on you in Yuma in 1851 to guard the Colorado River crossing of the Gila Trail. The Gila Trail was an 800 mile long wagon train trail from San Francisco or from Santa Fe, New Mexico to San Diego. Paddle boats were shipped in sections from San Francisco to the mouth of the Colorado River and then carried by 20 mule team to Yuma. When Dan arrived in Yuma, there were six steamboats and five barges plying these waters on the lower Colorado River. They hauled supplies from the fort and ore from the mines in the Arizona territory. Ore would be loaded onto the trains at Yuma to transport to LA and then to San Francisco for smelting. Frank Monahan and Dan Murphy frequently talked about prospecting gold and silver in the Arizona Territory. They realized that the best way to do this would be to have a store selling supplies to miners. The store would give them a foothold in the area. And furthermore, they predicted that their customers would gossip 
about where the richest ores were to be found. They saw themselves following the successful example of the big four who made their money selling the supplies to the 49ers in Sacramento. This is a slide of Huntington and Hopkins hardware store in Sacramento. Charles Crocker, who oversaw all the construction of the Southern Pacific, was frequently on the Yuma line. He arrived in his private car with a stock car behind it carrying his favorite Bay Morgan horse. Meanwhile, the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad, a competitor, backed by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, began to build a transcontinental line across the middle section of the continent along this green line. They, it was known as the 35th parallel. The 35th parallel crossed the Colorado River at a place called The Needles, which is named after a formation in the nearby mountains. The Atchison, uh, Collis Huntington lived in New York City to be close to the financial market. He panicked when he heard of the Atlantic and Pacific's intentions and directed Crocker to stop all construction on the Yuma line and immediately begin construction at Mojave and build east from there to from their San Francisco LA main line to Needles on the Colorado River. At the time, Mojave was a desolate water stop nearly 300 miles from Needles. At this point, I would like to take a, Murphy's life took a sharp turn Charles Crocker had taken a liking to Dan and Frank, and they had shared their dream with him of emulating Crocker and Hopkins and becoming shop owners in the shop owners and selling to desert miners. Crocker took Dan and Frank into his confidence and told him about the change of plans and how they were to build to needles a route. He made them a tempting offer to quit their jobs with the Southern Pacific and work for the Western Development Company. His plan was for them to operate a commissary car for the 4,000 plus Chinese laborers that would sell them treats like candy, liquor, clothing. Dan and Frank would rent the commissary car at a reduced rate from the Southern Pacific and stock it at their own expense, then keep any profits Additionally, they were to oversee the construction of the town on the Colorado River at the Needles, including building utilities and housing, while the Southern Pacific was constructing a 10-engine roundhouse. They would have at their disposal several hundred trained Chinese workers, and the construction materials would be provided by the Western Development Company. I want to focus your attention on one of the most important facts in the my book that I learned after, <laughs> while studying and researching for this project. After the death of Hopkins, the Western Development Company was renamed the Pacific Improvement Company. This company literally created the culture and lore of California. I learned that it was through his work with the Pacific Improvement Company that young Dan Murphy would incorporate nearly 40 companies and build out the future of California and the Southwest. This revelation came to me from reading Robert Orsi's groundbreaking book titled Sunset Limited, published in 2005. That's when I learned the true scope of the Pacific Improvement Company. Dr. Orsi wrote, by the 1880s, the Pacific Improvement Company was a gigantic coaling company and was one of the largest corporations in the American West. It controlled dozens of subsidiary companies, including diverse activity, doing diverse activities such as shipping, mining, publishing, urban and rural land development, resort hotels, water systems, and other public utilities for, throughout the railroad's territory. The Pacific Improvement Company dwarfed all other Western enterprises. The railroads by charter were not supposed to develop property. In essence, strict adherence to the law required them to build rail lines to nowhere. 
without towns, water, and agricultural resources, the territory served by the rail lines would be a virtual wasteland. Therefore, using the holding companies of the Pacific Improvement Company, the railroad is able to sell land grant property and at the same time develop the area. It's absurd to think or to believe that pioneers in California would stake out farmland and then grow olives, walnuts, almonds, prunes, apricots, etc. No, if left to their own resources, they would be growing beans and wheat or just raising sheep. Instead, when the population followed the new rail lines into California's rich agricultural land, the railroads sold the land along the railroads and specified what crops they should grow. Crops such as walnuts, almonds, raisins, prunes, and other certain fruits were not only valuable by weight, but also resistance to spoilage. The Pacific Improvement Company would also educate the farmers as to the best cultivation methods and how to successfully grow these exotic crops. And the railroad would provide transportation of their harvest to the eagerly awaiting markets. The Pacific Improvement Company undertook the development of high-class resorts and hotels. In addition to their farming activities, the our Hotel de Monte in Monterey was one such hotel. Castle Craig north of Reading and the Arcadia Hotel in Santa Monica, to name a few. All of these developments were an effort to improve the profitability and wealth of the railroad and the entire region. Once again, I need to emphasize that all the above came to fruition as the Pacific Improvement Company created advertisements and promotional materials that literally invented the mystique we know of as California today. For example, the Southern Pacific adapted in the images of a romanticized mission era. Similarly, the Santa Fe adopted the Southwest Pueblo and Zuni style for its promotional materials. And here's some examples. Shortly after the Atlantic and Pacific reached Needles, Huntington found himself in a tight financial situation and sold the newly created Mojave line to the Santa Fe. At this point, Dan and Frank just transferred over from the Southern Pacific to the Santa Fe's Pacific Land Improvement Company. Each railroad had their own improvement company. Their new boss was Godfrey Holterhoff, who was in charge of the Western Division of the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe. Here are pictures of the original depot in Needles. And here's the Monahan and Murphy General Store in Needles. Notice the similarities between Monahan and Murphy Store and Huntington and Hopkins Sacramento Store. This is my favorite photograph. This is a picture of Needles Plaza in front of the Monahan and Murphy Store about 1884. Notice the tall Mojave in the center of the doorway. His name was Smokestack. Murphy always employed at least one Mojave native in his store. And to the delight of the women customers, Smokestack would help them carry their purchases back to the awaiting train. This is the interior of Monahan and Murphy store and the Murphy Briggs Saloon in Needles, which was just down the boardwalk from the store. Dan Murphy brought his nephews from Ireland over to Needles and they started a express service. This is the stationery showing the 
mountain formation of the needles and the river across or the bridge across the Colorado River. Dan Murphy was the sheriff of Needles, and Frank Monahan was the Justice of the Peace. In the three-volume history of San Bernardino County, they're referred to as all the law there was in the West. This photograph of Mojave Chief Asakeet and his son, when Sheriff Murphy and his deputies took them to trial in San Bernardino. Dan is in the back row and the third one from the left. It's also important to note that Dan Murphy always had a soft spot for the Native Americans. When he and Frank finished their commissary car, they took the remaining supplies and set up a tent store. The Mojaves watched them with great curiosity and realized that a tent in the desert soon became a furnace. And they voluntarily went down the river and collected branches and limbs and built a wiki up like their own homes and over the tent, thereby solving the heat issue. Dan was only one in town who learned how to speak the Mojave language. He carried with him a little notebook, which he would phonetically write down their words. Another example of his care for the Mojave Indians was that uh, was this in incident of broke out between the townspeople and the natives. It was the habit of the Mojave women to gather driftwood along the river they used for cooking. Apparently the townsfolk were stealing the wood from these piles. Dan solved the problem by building a wood lot next to his store so that the townspeople could pay for the firewood when they bought their groceries. Dan then gave the cash to the women thereby giving the Mojave women a reliable and continuous source of income. Later, Dan noticed that the women struggled to get the wood up the muddy banks of the, to the store. So he went to the roundhouse and got a spare rails and ties and wheels. And the Mojave men laid the track from the river to the store. They put a push cart on the rails and easily transported the wood up to the store. The townspeople referred to it as Murphy, Murphy's push cart line. I do believe this is the only, the first and only incident of a white man creating a self-supporting business for Native women that lasted for nearly 50 years. Dan and Frank both had railroad passes due to their employment with the Pacific Land Improvement Company. Dan had a wife and two children in Wilmington in south of LA, and he could go visit them whenever he wished. Dan and he took turns to be away from the to be away from the store. Dan rarely went to Los Angeles. He never got over his original negative impression of the Pueblo. Dan became Charles Crocker's golden boy after having successfully ran the commissary car and built needles as requested. Crocker offered him access to the rarefied Del Monte Resort Hotel at Pebble Beach on the Monterey Peninsula. For Dan, this was a trip that he was easily taken to the glamorous resort. Another example of Dan's avoidance of Los Angeles was he chose to restock his store directly from suppliers on the east. This gave him an excuse to annually, if not more often, travel to Chicago and New York City. Train travel in the 1880s and 90s was a slow and arduous trip. It took more than a week. Dan's real education came from the smoking cars on these transcontinental trips, where he met numerous successful and well-to-do businessmen from across the country. With his free pass and his love of train travel, Dan took full advantage of the unique, this unique opportunity. I can't prove it, but I believe Dan Murphy was the first bi-coastal businessman. The local newspapers would chide him by printing that Dan Murphy was off to see Vanderbilt, which may be entirely true as we will see from his later investments. The Murphy and Monaghan General Store was very successful. 
as word spread, miners and prospectors from all over the Southwest came to Neal's for restocking. Murphy added a machine shop to repair mining equipment, which greatly increased their business. The Los Angeles newspapers claim that Monahan and Murphy store is known far and wide, and they are a household name throughout Arizona, New Mexico, and as far as San Antonio. By the 1890s, Dan and Frank were bringing in over $3 million annually in today's dollars. Gold and silver ore samples here showing nuggets found near Fair Play, Colorado. Dan and Frank realized that their early desires to go prospecting in Arizona territory. And in 1886, Dan following the lead from the bartender in Kingman, Arizona, that he had discovered a rich vein of gold. Dan and the bartender and a wealthy financier from Denver staked their claim to an extremely successful mine named the Josephine. Charles Crocker was proud of his golden boy and as a celebration of his windfall, he offered Dan an opportunity to stay at his private club in New York City. I am lucky to have found this letter at the Huntington Library that Dan wrote to Mr. Leroy and posted it from the club. Mr. Leroy was one of the richest men in New York City. He was founder of the Academy of Music, later replaced by the Metropolitan Opera. If you've been watching The Gilded Age on HBO, the club is the one they're always talking about. It was a private club of 100 male members of New York City's Gilded Age tycoons. The talk on the transcontinental smokers in the early 1890s was all about the World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, held in 1893. Often called the Fair that Changed America, the massive event introduced more than 26 million people to the abundance of modern marvels such as elevators, the zipper, the Ferris wheel, the first voice recording, and artificial ice. The attendees at the World's Fair were astonished at crystal clear artificial ice served in abundance with their refreshments. Also at the time, the railroads were struggling to ship fresh fruit and vegetables to the East Coast without spoiling. The Santa Fe had realized the importance and the value of having icing stations along its main line between Chicago, between California and Chicago. Dan was also impressed at the fair with the German exhibit displaying the manufacture of Portland cement. He had been struggling for years with smelting ores from mines and now realized that the process for making cement was very similar to smelting ore. Inspired by these two manufacturing processes, he would return to California to change the West forever. Murphy saw how these icy machines could benefit the railroad and offered to buy these massive condensing units right off the fairground floor. He also arranged to purchase a huge water pumps using the fair that was used at the fair for filling the canals. These massive pumps were able to deliver 1 million gallons per day, thereby forever eliminating the water shortages at the needles. This is pure genius by uh, Murphy and part of why ice came to be the title of my book. Having struck a tentative deal on the water pumps and ice making equipment, he returned to LA and presented his idea to Godfrey Holterhoff of the Santa Fe. Dan's proposal was to build an ice and water and electric generator in needles. Electric power would allow the roundhouse to operate 24 seven. Additional, additionally, electric lighting on the railroad station and its platforms would create quite a sight for the passengers as not even Los Angeles had electric lighting at the time. The icing station would be a boon for the Santa Fe, enabling it to ice all refrigerated, all the refrigerated train cars going east and 
they at a considerable profit. This is the uh, icing station of Dan Murphy at uh, Needles. And here's the interior showing the equipment that was shipped from the World's Fair. And the condensers to make the ice. These are refrigerated cars pulled up by a steam engine. And these are all Mojave laborers. And this, these white things are 100 pound blocks of ice that were dropped in from the top of the car. All of these re utilities ran off with specially adapted steam engines. The water pumps, refrigeration, condensers, and electric generators were all steam powered. At the close of the fair, he had several Santa Fe flatbed cars awaiting to load the massive equipment. Small town newspapers across the country reported as this gigantic equipment passed through the towns en route to California. After the Santa Fe purchased the Mojave Line, they also helped build a railroad from San Diego to San Bernardino, giving these previously bypassed cities access to a rail line. <coughs> At great effort, the Santa Fe built a connection over the, from San Bernardino to Mojave, passing over the Cajon Pass. The Fa Santa Fe was still paying the Southern Pacific high trackage fees for entering Los Angeles. Holterhoff purchased and combined several small railroads that ran through the San Gabriel Valley in order to create a route from San Bernardino into downtown Los Angeles. Once the Santa Fe had directed the route, had direct access to downtown on its own tracks, a rate war broke out. This well-known rate war between the Southern Pacific and the Santa Fe drove ticket prices from Chicago to LA down to $1 and directly led to the boom of the 80s this put Holterhoff and Murphy at a pivotal junction in Los Angeles, becoming a world-class city. Contrary to popular history, Edward Duhaney did not, was not the first one to discover oil in LA. He did hand dig a well near downtown Los Angeles. By the 1890s, there were over 400 wildcatters around downtown and Echo Park drilling for oil. They had nowhere, no way to store the oil. They dug pits and it leaked out onto the ground and onto the streets, creating a huge stench and an environmental disaster. The city council was hard on, upon the oil drillers to correct the problem, but Edward Doheny fought, fought back. Meanwhile, the Santa Fe began experimenting with oil in their locomotives. Doheny contracted with the Santa Fe to provide 20,000 barrels per month. Doheny bought up all the oil from the wildcatters and tried to corner the market price. He was unable to supply that much oil. And much to the chagrin of Godfrey Holterhoff and the Santa Fe, they began converting their locomotives back to coal. Holterhoff called upon his old friend Dan Murphy to help him out of this embarrassing situation. But Murphy wasn't interested in a competitive market. It's unlike him to enter into a business fraught with price cutting and at odds with the citizens of Los Angeles. However, to help out his friend, he quietly went south near Fullerton and bought land that had oil seeps, not like that you see at La Brea Tar Pits. Dan then created the Brea Canyon Oil Company with Doheny and several Pacific Land Improvement Company executives as board members. Doheny only had to point to where they should drill. And on December the, of 1888, excuse me, 1899, the Brea Canyon Company let go of the largest gusher in the LA basin. If the gusher flowed unassisted for many years, 
being one of the most productive wells in all of California. All the oil from Brea Canyon was initially to go to the Santa Fe, but it was more than they could use. Holderhoff released Doheny from his contract, and within months, he, Doheny left California for New Mexico, or for Mexico, where he made his fortune. The excess oil was piped <clears throat> by the Brea Oil Canyon to the ocean, where it was shipped to Standard Oil Refinery in Richmond, in, in the Bay Area. Dan had a sister that lived in Leadville, Colorado. One of the leading miners in Leadville was John Sinnott, who had five daughters. Dan's sister Mary was always trying to get him to marry one of these women. They lived most of the year with their mother in San Jose, while John remained tending the mines in Leadville. After 17 years of absence in Leadville, he came home to San Jose ill and died one month later. <clears throat> As word hit Leadville, his business partners ran off with all the assets, leaving the Senate women destitute. With his newfound wealth, Dan decided he needed a wife. And four months later, he followed his sister's advice and married one of the Senate daughters, Antoinette. There were only two witnesses at their marriage. It took place in St. Joseph's Church in San Jose, after the 10 o'clock mass. She wore a gray serge suit and he was dressed in his usual three-piece suit. Instead of a honeymoon, Antoinette and her younger sister Sue went on a three-week vacation to White Sulphur Springs near Napa. Typical of Dad, Dan's altruistic style, he and Antoinette made an agreement that Dan would provide for her mother and sisters for the rest of their lives, and that they would adopt a sister, her sister, Grace's son. Grace had died of cholera a few years earlier. The reason was twofold. Dan needed a male heir to take over his fortune. And secondly, probably due to his Catholic guilt of being so wealthy that he should take care of these destitute women. Antoinette would not live in Needles, so Dan bought her a new house in Los Angeles near USC. She knew no one in LA. She had her sister Sue come and live with them, which Sue did until she died 40 years later. Dan took offices in downtown Los Angeles and routinely made visits to Brea Canyon oil fields. He never left the original plot of of the oil fields, and he drilled several more wells, many of which turned into massive gushers. Here is one blowing off na natural gas, which broke the, the derrick. You can see the oil field in the background. This is a, a more recent picture. This is uh, in the probably in the uh, 1920s. Dan was soon invited to be on every major bank board on to be on the board of every major bank in LA. In 1901, he organized to buy out the California Portland Cement Company, the largest cement company factory this side of the Mississippi. Within a year, he was the sole owner of the company, just as LA and Southern California was constructing roads and sidewalks and spillways, dams, buildings. In all of these various and diverse industries that Dan owned, he always adhered to the same management style he learned from his mentor, Charles Crocker, who, all, who allowed all his men, all possible latitude, to work out all the details. Once Antoinette realized Dan's true wealth, she wanted a mansion to match her newfound status. Over a period of several years, Dan put together 12, a 12 acre estate on West Adams Boulevard near Western Avenue. This is the house that he built. It's out of California Portland cement. 
This is the back of the house with Antoinette's gardens that when it was first new. The interior. However, before they moved into this new home, Sue announced that she was pregnant. In a panic, they went to the Bishop of Los Angeles, who arranged for Sue to go to an orphanage in White Plains, New York, where she delivered her baby. She left her baby girl there for four years until Dan and Antoinette returned and adopted her at the orphanage, thus avoiding any scandal for Sue or the Murphy family. They named the little girl Bernadine. She apparently had an, Sue apparently had an affair with Prince Rispoli, an Italian royal who was visiting the Bay Area in 1903. It's an intriguing story in the book. Beginning in 1901, Dan, Antoinette, and Sue went to Europe every other year until 1918, when the influenza epidemic prevented them from traveling. The first two trips were spent collecting furniture, antiques, and especially garden ornaments for Antoinette's world-class garden. On every trip, they went to the Vatican and they had a private audience with the Pope, at which time Dan would hand him a check for a million dollars for the Pope's personal charities. When Bernadine became of age, she and Sue would go for extended periods of time to Rome, where they, entertain, where they were entertained by the Rispoli family and Rome's high society. In 1921, it was leaked to the international news in the LA Times that Bernadine and Prince Federico Borromeo were going to marry. This caused a great uproar in both Milan and Los Angeles, as each family was shocked at such an announcement. The Italian ambassador immediately went to LA and to the Murphy home to meet with the Murphy family. Dan was distraught because if she married an Italian man, his entire fortune would go to her, would go to her Italian husband. Bernadine and Federico's love affair went on long after Dan's death. Frank Monahan passed away in 1921 and Godfrey Holterhoff passed away while still working at the Santa Fe at the age of 63 in 1923. None of Dan's contemporaries had any idea of his true wealth. For example, in 1908, between 1908 and 1917, he averaged $22 million annually in today's money. These were just from dividends, which did not include his profits from ice, oil, or mining. Until his death, he was the largest stockholder of Standard Oil of California. He is the reason El Segundo is where it is, and he is referred to as the founder of the town of El Segundo. Between 1927 and 29, his dividends were bringing in over $31 million annually. During the First World War, Dan was made executive vice president of the Los Angeles Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company, which was commissioned by the federal government to build supply ships for the war effort. Dan took many trips to Washington, D.C. to negotiate contracts, and several times they turned out ships in record time. In 1931, the government began construction of Hoover Dam at the very location that Dan had pointed out to the Army Corps of Engineers nearly 50 years after the Mojave Indians had showed him the site. Of course, California Portland Cement was one of the suppliers for the dam's construction. In 1931, Dan was awarded an honorary degree from Loyola University. And at that time, he was also given the honorary title of Papal Knight. Antoinette's Grand Italian Gardens won numerous awards and surpassed the Huntington Gardens for many years. She died at home in 1939, and so did Dan. 
the following year in 1930. She died in 38, and Dan died the following year in 39, at the age of 81. Bernadine lived on in the house until she married Daniel Donahue in 1956. They donate, donated the West Adams Mansion to the Archdiocese, who had the magnificent horn, home torn down and scraped clean to the lot. Today, the Archdiocese is still pumping oil there and fracking. It's called the Murphy Drill Site. In 1960, Bernadine was awarded the title of Papal Countess, an honor she shared with Estelle Doheny and Rose Kennedy, JFK's mother. In 1957, Bernadine and Daniel formed the Dan Murphy Foundation in order to charitably disperse Dan's vast fortune. It continues to this day, 80 years since his death, annually granting $5 million in donations, and of course, the million dollars to the Pope every year. Bernadine and Daniel moved to Waverly Drive in Los Feliz until Bernadine's death in 1969. They had helicoptered Antoinette's rare trees from West Adams to Los Feliz. Quite a sight for Los Angeles citizens. When Bernadine died, her husband donated the Waverly House to the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart for a convent. In 2010, you may recall the controversy between the Archdiocese and the Sisters over the ownership of Waverly, Die, Waverly Drive. One of the nuns dropped dead in court during the trial. The Archdiocese won and sold it to Katy Perry. <laughs> so there you have it. Dan Murphy and his friend Godfrey Holterhoff had more to do with the current day LA than any two men that I can think of. You can read more about these two men in Los Angeles, early movers and shakers in ice and oil. It's 31 pages with over 650 footnotes, end notes, and fully indexed with a bibliography and two appendices. I'm proud to say it won the best book award finalist it's a fascinating story and thoroughly researched reviews say it's an exciting read and the, Lo the Los Angeles Westerners review quoted as highly recommended and entertaining and educational biography. So thank you. Well, thank you. That was a great presentation and you certainly have researched this subject matter in deep detail. I think you've been working on this for, for 10 years, right? 10 years. <laughs> yeah. So everyone, if you have, we will start our Q&A session now. So if you have questions for uh, Joe, type them in uh, at the bottom of your screen. You have the Q&A button. Uh, just click there and it will open up so you can type in your questions. Uh, so in the meantime, Joe, talk, talk a little bit more, more about the, your research process. You, you re, worked on this for 10 years. Uh, I know I, I read in your book that the, uh, um, you know, there wasn't that much information out there. And how did you go about to, to find all of this? Well, <laughs> uh, the, the, the research was fun. All research is always fun. And uh, the first three years uh, was an amazing experience of identifying just one more library that had no reference to Dan Murphy. Dan Murphy never wanted his name in the paper. He never allowed interviews. He never allowed pictures. All of these mug books that, that, that you see back here that are of Los Angeles businessmen. He's not in any of them. Uh, he was a very modest person. And uh, the, it was the, uh, the writing of the book and that uh, took the longest time and several revisions and four different uh, editors. <laughs> it was fun. So we're starting to get some uh, questions in here. So uh, Joe, I'm gonna remind you too, that if you click on the Q&A button, uh, you yes. will see the list of questions and, and I'll read them to you. So the first one is, uh, did Bernadine have any children? 
No, no, she didn't. Uh, the she had wanted to. She fell in love with Federico Bormeo. This is of the Bormeo family that that built Milan in the Middle Ages, and uh, there's a Saint uh, Charles Bormeo. Uh, but for some reason, uh, they never married, and they conversed uh, by letter uh, for nearly 30 years until she married Daniel Donahue, but no, she never had any children. Um, next question, uh, was there any relation to the brothers of <laughs> St. John of God? Absolutely. Uh, St. John of God is on uh, the, uh, uh, the, nor what, the uh, northwest corner of Adams Boulevard and Western. It's a retirement home. It's uh, run by uh, the uh, Brothers of St. John of God, which was directly across the street from the Murphy House. And Bernadine, being a spinster, would spend a lot of time visiting the sick and the elderly over at St. John of God. But when it became apparent that she would lose her fortune if she married the love of her life, she married a defrocked brother of St. John of God, Daniel Donahue, and they then uh, donated the house in West Adams to the Archdiocese and moved to Waverly Drive. So there is a connection. Did it seem that Antoinette and Dan genuinely loved each other or one another, or was their marriage just one of convenience? Well, that's why uh, we'll never know. You never know about these sort of things. Uh, he was definitely uh, devoted to her, and that's why I described how they got married. And you know, it was a, a marriage of arrangement. Uh, he definitely uh, loved and worshipped Bernadine. He did everything he possibly could. But I'm sure uh, Bernadine broke his heart when uh, she fell in love with Federico Bormeo. And this uh, uh, wedding that uh, was announced in the, from Rome in the international news and the LA Times uh, was a, a real uh, scandal. Uh, everybody in LA knew uh, who she was and that she was very wealthy. Uh, and they thought that uh, they would, she would become a princess, but uh, that never happened. So I, I really don't know the, uh, the answer to that, but I think it was uh, a, a marriage of arrangement. Uh, are you familiar with Leslie Brand and his involvement in development, developing uh, a railroad from LA, San Pedro to Glendale? Did he work with Dan Murphy? That's a very complicated subject. Uh, and it took me a long time to learn railroad history and to get up on the platform of railroad history. But the combination of these little lines through San Gabriel uh, by uh, Godfrey Holterhoff uh, is a very complex situation. And so no, to, to be truthful, I'm no expert on that, that complex history. How come so little is known of Dan Murphy, really? Well, that's due to Dan Murphy's own choice. He didn't want anyone to know about him. And nobody did. And they didn't even during his own lifetime have any idea of how much money he had. Uh, he, he was just a master of uh, disguise, you might say. Uh, but... Uh, he avoided Los Angeles. He didn't come to the city until he was dragged into the city by uh, Halterhoff to solve this problem of oil. Uh, he was uh, he was an acquaintance of uh, Dan uh, of uh, uh, Doheny, because Doheny, you know, was a, a hard rock miner out in New Mexico. He and Canfield, and uh, they knew each other through no doubt through the store of Monaghan and Murphy and Needles because it was the only game in town in the Southwest. And uh, he came to town and 
by that time, he was already a wealthy man. The oil just pushed it over the top. And he always, from the World's Fair time, when he saw that uh, German exhibit at the World's Fair making how they made Portland cement, and for many years, he had struggled with smelting ore out in needles because he believed that that would make the whole territory wealthy again because uh, the miners couldn't uh, have an outlet for, for this ore. Well, a long story short, uh, he knew uh, that uh, uh, Portland cement was a lot like mining, but instead of having to dig down into the ground, if you remember along uh, the 10 freeway at Colton, there used to be a big white mountain, which was pure limestone. And that's California Portland cement. It's now gone and that's closed. And they just recently, the Dan Murphy Foundation, only in the last uh, five or ten, five years maybe sold Portland cement. Did Bernardine know that the West Adams house was going to be raised when she donated it to the church? Oh, yes. Sham. Oh, yes. Uh, she was living alone in the house uh, with her sister Sue, uh, outlived uh, her parents, uh, outlived Dan and Nettie. And uh, then Bernadine took care of Sue until she died. And then Sue's older sister, uh, Catherine, came and lived with her. And she was in her late 70s, early 80s. Bernadine had to take care of her until she died. <clears throat> and once she died, she was living alone with servants, of course. Uh, but uh, when she married, uh, it, again, that was a, a marriage of, of, of an arranged marriage between Daniel Donahue and her. And so he was anxious to get her out of that house and out of the neighborhood because the neighborhood had changed drastically. Um, and she knew, I think that she was the idea that she didn't want anyone to live in that house. It had a chapel uh, that was uh, uh, sanctioned by the Vatican. Uh, so they, they just decided that rather than have, have it go to some ill repute use, they tore it down. So yes, okay. I think Bernadine knew all about that. And here is another question. Uh, Dan's sister got pregnant with Bernadine uh, as a result of an illicit affair. Was this considered scandalous at a time? <laughs> it would ruin you. In Victorian times, at the turn of the century, if you had an illegal pregnancy, you, you not only you, but your family would have a very bad reputation. It would ruin your reputation. And, it, <clears throat> and Sue was Antoinette's sister, not Dan's sister. Uh, so uh, they, it was an, an exotic plan and it didn't end with just taking them to the orphanage. The, Dan Murphy had to pay his dues. He was, uh, <laughs> he was uh, donated uh, uh, 10 acres to, uh, for a Magdalene laundry. If you've read books about Magdalene laundries, uh, that was in West Adams also, uh, and it was part of his reparation for the good deed that the uh, bishop done, had done by, by secreting the real birth of Bernadine. It, it was never became known. In fact, when the book was published, I got a little feedback from Shirtail relatives that were shocked to learn this. Uh, after Dan purchased California Portland Cement Company, did he maintain a relationship with previous owners, the Fleming family? Oh, no. <clears throat> yes. Uh, that's a very intelligent question. Fleming was, uh, was in, he was an owner of California Portland Cement before Dan Murphy bought it. And he kept, uh, Dan Murphy kept Fleming there. And Fleming ran the plant 
just like uh, uh, I said that he used uh, Crocker's style of management to let Fleming make all the decisions uh, uh, all of the time to, for the best results. And then uh, after Fleming came Dookie, and yes, he was friends with the family. Uh, well, he owned the company. Uh, and uh, so all of these people that were uh, presidents of uh, California Portland Cement were also friends of Dan Murphy. Uh, what difference is it between Doheny and uh, Murphy regarding oil digging? Doheny dug the first hand, hand dug the first well. That's because he didn't have any money and he couldn't afford any drilling equipment. The wildcatters and soon Doheny also started drilling using a derrick and a drill. And these were run by steam engines. So you can imagine the cacophony of noise and stink from oil that was going on in California uh, or in uh, downtown LA. By the time, as time passed, you know, this developed very quickly. Within a year or two, Dan Murphy, when he went down to uh, Brea Canyon, as you saw from those pictures, they were already using de uh, derricks. And so Dan Murphy's, all of Dan Murphy's wells were, were uh, uh, drilled by a more conventional method. I think, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, did he have a connection to the former Daniel Murphy High School? Yes, he did. Only a name. He would have been appalled that the archdiocese named a high school after him. He was anonymous. He, he lived an anonymous life, and he didn't want his name on anything. But contrary to his, well, he was dead. You can't control from the grave. But Bernadine allowed it. Uh, to have uh, the high school renamed the Dan and Murphy High School. Going back to the house in uh, uh, West Adams, uh, after the house was raised, what was built on the side, on, the, <laughs> on that site, and, and did it uh, stay in the church? Yes, the Archdiocese owns it today. Uh, and there's nothing there, uh, but there is behind a high wall, a very controversial uh, called the Murphy Drill Site, where as soon as the archdiocese uh, was given the property from Bernadine, uh, they drilled a well there. Uh, Dan Murphy always knew there was oil underneath of that house because they had a huge fountain uh, as part of Antoinette's gardens, and it used to have an oil slick on the top of it. Furthermore, Dan Murphy bought all of the oil rights, all the mineral rights, for 60 acres around that house. And I used to live in that neighborhood, and I remember when I bought my house, it came without the mineral rights. I didn't know that Dan Murphy owned those. But anyhow, the, the Archdiocese still owns it, they're fracking there. It's a controversial thing that's in, in the news uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, and they've passed laws to stop drilling oil in Los Angeles. And this will definitely shut down the Murphy drill site. The sooner the better. A couple of more questions here. Uh, let's see if I pronounce this correctly. Where was the uh, Magdalene Laundry in West Adams? Uh, at uh, on Arlington between Pico and Venice Boulevard. It's now uh, owned by the LA public school system, uh, but there is still the convent of, uh, for the, uh, uh, the Sisters of Social Service uh, have a convent there, which is the remnant of the Magdalene Laundry. But the, uh, uh, the Magdalene Laundry started in uh, uh, 1900, well, after, uh, <laughs> after Bernadine, or after Sue had her child. Uh, so uh, about 1904 until uh, into the uh, late 50s or early 60s before it was, it was a huge facility, but uh, it's no longer there. So maybe 
maybe this is the last question. <laughs> is the uh, um, Monaghan and Murphy store building still standing? And are there store records archived somewhere, like the Huntington Library? <laughs> Uh, you, it's funny you should bring out the Huntington Library. I showed you a pic, uh, picture of a of the Union Club letter. Uh, that was the only scrap of paper at the Huntington that had Dan Murphy's name on it. That has since changed since I've written the book, and the Dan Murphy Foundation has given records to the Huntington Library, uh, business records from the <clears throat> from the Dan Murphy companies that he owned. But uh, regarding Monaghan and Murphy store, no, that burned down. Uh, it was rebuilt. And so the, uh, the, it's now the uh, Needles Museum. And the records from Dan Murphy, I did find uh, at um, uh, Cal State San Bernardino, of all places. Uh, they, they had uh, the ledger books and so forth from, uh, the, the, from Dan Murphy's uh, store. I can't say right. it was extensive, though, but uh, they, had, they do have some records. All right. So I'm just going to reach out to Todd here, uh, since you are one of the panelists, you can actually not type in the question. So Todd, do, do you happen to have a question that you want, want to ask? If you do, please jump in. Um, well, I think my questions were pretty much covered by other people's questions. Uh, I'll note that you got some compliments in the chat section, uh, Joe, and a comment that someone has already purchased your book. <laughs> I, I suspect there'll be some more book sales in the next day or two. <laughs> And I, I do see a so. question there, but I noted that it was repeated in the question section, so I won't bother to read that. I think right, we've covered right. all our questions. Uh, there's a couple of more comments here that, that just came in. One is just saying, to, thank you, Joe. Um, another one is saying, I hope Our Lady sells this amazing book in their gift, store, uh, gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> what, what gift shop? Oh, as I, or I would assume, Our Lady, I, I would assume that the uh, cathedral in downtown. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. The Dan Murphy Foundation is not in support of this book. Uh, I thought when I started doing the research that, oh, they've got $240 million. This is a pushover. I'll just go and, you know, present them the proposal to write a biography on Dan Murphy, their founder, since nobody knows anything. And to my surprise, they said, no, we would like to honor Dan's thoughts of being anonymous and we would not support the book. And uh, no, they wouldn't sell the book uh, because uh, they're fracking. Follow up question here, but you, you actually answered that. Why is the foundation not thrilled with the new book? And, so, and remember also that 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 that, that uh, Bernadine and Daniel's house on Waverly Drive was donated to those sisters of the Sacred the, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, Immaculate Conception. I forget them always confused, but anyhow, it was donated to them. And the uh, Archdiocese took those poor nuns to court in order to uh, get that property back in their hands. Well, thank you so much, Joe. This was uh, great and really appreciate that you reached out to us and, and that we can do this. Uh, do you have any final comments before we uh, end for tonight? No, I'm really honored to, to have been able to do this for the uh, Los Angeles City Historical Society. <clears throat> I was on the board for several years with uh, Irene Treason and and uh, David Cameron and Danny Munoz and many others that are no longer with us. So it's a uh, it's a great honor, and I, uh, I I am very proud of the Historical Society. You've improved a whole lot since I was on the board. So thank you. Okay.